We told you in a previous video how Saudi Arabia wants to leave behind once and for all its addiction to oil and become a nation similar to Dubai or Abu Dhabi. In this video, we're going to look at the country in more depth in order to get an idea of just how this mission to get free from oil is going. The thing is, there is a specific name, a leader behind this ambitious plan. And my question to you is, do you know who this person is? Well, for those of you who don't, the person who is turning everything upside down in Saudi Arabia is Mohammed bin Salman. But a name alone, it doesn't explain much. So now you might be wondering, who is this man really? What are his intentions? And what exactly is he trying to do? Well, these are the questions that we're going to be answering in today's visual politic video. So let's get started, shall we? The Prince of Change. He might only be a little more than 30 years old, but Mohammed bin Salman is already one of the most powerful people in the world, and he controls more money than we could ever possibly count. Formerly, well, he is the Minister of Defense, Deputy Crown Prince, Second Deputy Prime Minister, Chief of the Royal Court, and Chair of the Council for Economic and Development Affairs. So what does all of this mean? Well, it kind of means that Mohammed bin Salman is in control of, well, everything. He's got complete control over the country's oil, over the massive financial reserves that have been accumulated over the years, and also over Saudi Arabia's massive defense budget. So today, the power of the prince is practically total. And hey, well, this isn't something normal either. Never has such a young man had so much power before. Up until now, the norm was for the country to be controlled by seniors of 80 or more years who were very reluctant to go for any kind of change. But all of a sudden, change is underfoot because what Mohammed bin Salman is trying to do with Saudi Arabia is turn it into a new United Arab Emirates, a country which the prince has an enormous amount of admiration for. Later, we're going to see just how he is doing this, but for now, you need to bear something in mind. The youth of the country cheer bin Salman as the savior of the kingdom. And this is a country where half of its population is less than 25 years old, and so in a country like that, it's pretty important. But so now you might be wondering, where does this man come from? How can such a young man have so much power? Well, he's the son of the current king. But wait just a second before you exclaim, well, of course he is, because you need to know that being the son of the king in Saudi Arabia wasn't always such an important thing. In fact, for now, bin Samal is not even the heir to the Saudi throne. The Battle Over the Throne Salman bin Abdulaziz is the king of Saudi Arabia. He is the son of the man who is considered the founder of the country, Abdulaziz bin Saud. Well, since Saud died in 1953, the kingdom has been inherited by brother after brother. Abdulaziz bin Saud had 17 known wives, and it is calculated that he also had around 32 sons. So there were quite a few potential heirs. The thing is that when the current king, who is believed to be the 25th son, reached power a few years ago in 2015, the first thing he did was change the laws of secession. Even though some of his brothers are still alive, he has decided to put the new generations in charge of this process. To do this, he has decided to appoint his nephew, Mohammed bin Nayef, who is closer to Washington than others, and he has been in charge of security for the last few years, as well as the secret services and the fight against fundamentalism. However, it seems like young Mohammed bin Salman, the main character in this video, it seems he's not very happy about that, and it seems that he is taking aim at the throne. He wants to be the future king of Saudi Arabia. So his eagerness for reforms could be explained as an attempt to gain popularity. In fact, that is what most analysts currently think, and well, it does make sense. The fall of the price of oil has given Mohammed bin Salman the opportunity to aim for the throne, which is something his father obviously supports. If Saudi Vision 2030 starts showing good results, bin Salman will be in a better position to ask for a reward and become, potentially, the new heir to the throne. However, there are a few problems on the road ahead, both for bin Salman as well as the country. On the one hand, there are problems inside the royal family. Bin Salman has made a lot of enemies who accuse him of being power-hungry. On the other hand, his father, the current king, is quite old. 81 years, and he seems to have some memory issues. So this means that there are two possible scenarios ahead. If the current king lives for many more years, the prince, bin Salman, will be able to consolidate his power. However, if the king doesn't live so long, the current heir, bin Salman's cousin, could become the new king and wish goodbye both to the prince and his Saudi Vision 2030. 
Mm. But the reality is, is that this is how monarchies work. But I'm pretty sure that some of you by now are probably thinking, well, this is all fascinating, Simon, but why should I care what happens in Saudi Arabia? Well, you should care, and probably more than you think. Saudi Arabia is still the biggest oil producer, and it is also the most important and influential country in the Arab world. An evolution towards openness for this country could be something very positive for the world, and for now, the planned Saudi Vision 2030 seems to be the only opportunity for the country to progress and evolve. But now that we've said that, what exactly is the plan for this country? Incorrigibles. So far in today's story, we've seen a handsome prince and a battle over the throne, but we need a third ingredient for this Saudi soap opera, and that's luxury and money. Well, of all the royal families in the world, the Sauds, the royal household of Saudi Arabia, might be the most addicted to money and luxury. And, well, now you're gonna see why. As we have mentioned in several videos, the fall of oil prices has jeopardized many countries, and among them is Saudi Arabia. Only in 2016, and even though many adjustments were made, the country had a deficit of more than $80 billion. And now the question becomes, what can they do in order to fix such a hole in their budget? Well, in 2016, the Saudi government announced that the country was going to go on a diet. So for the first time in decades, austerity reached Saudi Arabia. The government of bin Salman started with reductions in public wages, canceled many projects whose profitability was uncertain, reduced subsidies on gasoline, water, electricity. This was a pretty huge shock for one of the most subsidized economies in the world. I mean, up until now, dear viewer, oil had helped pay for everything in Saudi Arabia. However, hold on for just a moment because, well, that's not the whole story. Under Salman's rule, princes still enjoy many material privileges. The subsidization system hasn't changed for the royal household. Take a look at this. The king of Saudi Arabia has ultra-luxurious palaces all over the world that are available to him. In Marbella in Spain, he has El Rocio, a palace inspired by no less than the White House. But I mean, it's gotta be pretty boring, right, to have to go to the same palace all the time. I mean, how tiresome. So last summer, the king built a new and gigantic palace in Tangier in Morocco. The palace has its very own hospital, and here the king gets French seafood delivered direct from France. But I mean, hey, what's the problem with chartering a few airplanes so the king can eat some nice lobsters, right? Oh, and by the way, when the king of Saudi Arabia travels, he travels big. In his last tour around Asia, in 2016, the king traveled with 1,500 people, and he took with him two Mercedes-Benz S600 limousines. In order to carry it all, 27 planes had to be used. Yes, so it seems that this is what the royal family considers austerity. And the prince, our main character, he's no different either. During holidays in France, and at the same time oil prices were falling, Prince Salman saw the yacht of the Russian magnate Yuri Scheffler. It was love at first sight. He sent an assistant right away in order to close the deal. Salman bought it for 550 million US dollars. So now you know how the family likes to live, and well, they are quite a big family. Some estimations indicate that the Saudi royal family has around 15,000 members. The government has evaded the question of membership numbers, but even low end estimates put it at about 5,000 people. And we're talking about people who live thanks to the public budget and have all kinds of privileges. They are paid impressive salaries, they have access to hospitals, which are essentially five star palaces, and they do profitable business with the government. They have incredible incredibly luxurious and honestly rather incredible lifestyles. And the reality is that that is very, very expensive. According to estimations from the US government, since transparency is not a tradition in the royal family, they spend about $2 billion every year in order to keep up their sumptuous lifestyles. But some other estimates indicate the royal family takes over a million barrels of oil a day, which is 10% of the national production. Progress of Saudi Vision 2030. Despite all of this, the transition of Saudi Arabia planned in Vision 2030 keeps moving forward. Saudi Arabia designs a city of entertainment almost as big as Las Vegas. 
but the truth is that it is moving slowly. And for the time being, Saudi Arabia is regaining better relations with the United States. In fact, Donald Trump's first international visit as the US president was to Riyadh. But yes, in order to achieve that, the Saudis had to sign some pretty big checks. Trump signs the single largest arms deal in US history with Saudi Arabia, worth $350 billion. And this has to be added to the billion dollar contracts they already have with some of the largest companies in the United States. And it all has a target in mind. Saudi Arabia wants to reinforce the protection it has from the US to defend from possible enemies such as Iran. We're actually going to be discussing this special relationship in a future video, so please do not forget to subscribe. But leaving the US aside, in the last few months, Saudi Arabia has set the world's largest fund for technological investments. They have $100 billion available to invest. Furthermore, the country is eliminating many restrictions on foreign investments and some projects are being already discussed. Some of these have already been put into motion, such as theme parks, huge hotel resorts, and even nuclear power plants. But as we have been telling you, transforming this country won't be easy at all, and this is just the start of their very own soap opera. There's the huge money wastage of the royal family, which means they have to deal with a lot of criticism from the country's powerful religious leaders, who, by the way, have a terrible lack of respect for civil rights. Then there is the war in Yemen and the uncertainty of the heir to the Saudi throne. So now, what do you think about the luxurious lifestyle of the Saudi royal family? Do you think Riyadh will ever become some sort of Dubai? Well, please leave your answers in the comments below and do click like if you enjoyed this video and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every Monday and every Thursday. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.